guys welcome back to my channel and if you're new my name is holly um i just want to quickly mention that in my last video sometimes the camera decided to try and focus on this plant behind me it was very sad looking kind of droopy but it's definitely picked up a bit now so if that does happen you're not going to be looking at like a really droopy sad plant anymore um, hopefully that won't happen in this video. Today's video is going to be another Who Done It Wednesday. This is actually another video that I wrote the script for like a year ago and I just never got around to filming it. Um, it is the case of the kidnapping and murder of Shauna Howe and this case went unsolved for about 10 years. And just to give a quick disclaimer, all this information is what I found online through different online sources and I've compiled it all into this one video. I do my very best to make sure all the information is accurate and obviously this isn't meant to offend anyone. So let's get into the video. Shauna was a brown haired, blue eyed 11 year old girl from Oil City, Pennsylvania. She lived with her mum, stepdad, an older brother and a younger sister. Her mother Lucy described her as sassy and headstrong. Uh, she was in the church choir and like most children around that age, she loved Halloween, trick or treating, dressing up and putting costumes together. And that's really where this story starts. It's actually a couple of days before Halloween. On the 22nd of October 1992, Shauna Howe had quite a busy day ahead of her. After school, she was going to head straight to a local nursing home to sing for the residents and afterwards she'd be going to a Halloween party that was put on by her local Girl Scouts. For her costume, Shauna dressed as a gymnast. This was put together with things that she had at home, including a black and turquoise stripy leotard, gloves and tights. And this party she went to was to finish between 7.30 and 8 p.m. Shauna and her friend Joey L started to walk home after the party was over until they got to the point where they would split off from each other. So Joey would go her way and Shauna would go another way. Um, but at this point it was dark so Joey L did offer Shauna to come back to her house where they'd both walk together and then her father could possibly drop her off or get someone to pick her up. But Shauna actually refused this offer and and decided to just walk it alone. At 8.30, Shauna's stepdad was wondering where she was. He decided to take the car out and drive the street that she would have walked home. Um, he didn't see her, so he did end up driving surrounding area um, just to see if maybe she'd taken an alternative route. But ultimately, he didn't see her, so he went back home hoping that she would be there when he got back. He also had a phone call from Lucy where he asked where Shauna was. This is when Lucy realised that she hadn't actually arranged that lift that she was supposed to and she said that the party should definitely be over now and Shauna should be home. So she told him to ring the hospitals to make sure there hadn't been any accidents or anything like that. By 9.30, Shauna still wasn't home. Her mum arrived home at 10 p.m. and Shauna was still nowhere to be found. And this is when Lucy decided to call the police. The police go to Shauna's home and initially they think maybe she's just gone to a friend's house or maybe she's lost. However, while they're there, a call comes through to the police via a walkie-talkie saying that a man named Dan Payton had actually seen Shauna being kidnapped. Dan Payton was walking along West First Street in Oil City at around 8pm when he saw a young girl wearing a gymnastics outfit walking along the opposite side of the road, as well as a man he described as a tall, skinny guy wearing a baseball cap coming in the opposite direction. He then proceeds to hear a scream and sees Shauna being grabbed and shoved into a red Chevrolet that then speeds off. He didn't have a cell phone, which was quite common back then. It was only 1992. So he began running around knocking on people's front doors until someone let him in to use their landline to call the police. So from this point, they now know that Shauna has been taken. And the reason they're only now finding out about this information a couple of hours after the initial reporting is that the police um, didn't really know what to do with the information when they first had it. Uh, no one had been reported missing yet. All they know is that someone had witnessed a kidnapping. So it wasn't until they arrived at Shauna's house that they could really put two and two together, if that makes sense. Robert Werner was an officer on patrol that night and got called in to help look for Shauna. The police immediately set up roadblocks in and out of the city and there were almost 30 police officers out looking for her everywhere, whether it was on foot questioning people in the streets or out driving looking for that red vehicle. They didn't have much luck finding her that evening and 
and by the next day everyone in the community knew that Shauna had been kidnapped and hundreds of people came out to help look for her. Shauna's parents couldn't go out looking for her, they were told to stay at home just in case someone tried to call them, uh, for example in case someone tried to get a ransom from them. Uh, this only made Lucy feel helpless and trapped, she wanted to be out there looking for Shauna but she just couldn't. On October 29th, two days after Shauna's abduction, a man was out in a place called Coulter's Hole. It's a fishing, hunting, camping area. It's very secluded. It's somewhere kids would go to drink underage or just hang out. Well, this man notices a clothing item under a bridge and this piece of clothing had been there overnight. It was wet from like the damp in the air, you know, like when you see dew on the grass in the morning. Shauna's stepdad gets a call from the police saying that they want him to come down and just take a look at it and possibly identify it. When he gets there, he walks up to it and he immediately knows that it's Shauna's leotard that she was wearing the night she was taken. The leotard was taken in for testing and they found several cell samples on the suit from semen and there was enough there that they could get a sample of DNA from it. So Shauna's parents now knew that she had most likely been sexually assaulted but they were still holding out hope that she could still be alive and so were the police. They were hoping that Shauna was still alive too so they combed the area where the suit was found looking for Shauna or some more evidence but nothing was found. Halloween was literally cancelled by police as well as parents. No one wanted their children out, they didn't want any other opportunities for a kidnapping to happen. However the the following day, police got a call from a man who was at a nearby cottage, also at Coulter's Hole. He found Shauna's body just before 9am. He had been walking across a tessel bridge when he looked down and saw her lying face down on the floor of the rocky creek bed between a rock and a log. And this was only 500 metres from where her leotard had been found. She was wearing shorts, her shirt was on backwards and she was also wearing socks that weren't hers. Like I said earlier, the police had already searched this area the day before, this bridge being one of those places, which means the body was only placed there very recently. The kidnapper or now killer came back in the middle of the night after police had done their search and dumped her body by throwing her off the bridge. Police do believe that Shauna was alive when she was thrown off the bridge and didn't pass away for up to 10 minutes later. Her cause of death was pronounced as blunt force trauma to the head and chest which was caused from the 30 plus foot fall from the bridge which caused fractured ribs and lacerations. She also had a footprint to her face and multiple injuries to her knees, likely to have happened before this from wherever she was kept after the abduction and before being moved to the bridge because she would have been kept somewhere the three days prior to her death. There was also evidence of multiple sexual assaults. Another thing was Shauna's shoes. They were placed on the bridge above. Uh, they were next to each other, one shoe facing one way, one shoe facing the other and the police believe that this was purposeful because the chance that they would just land that way or be put that way and not have fallen off the bridge as well is very slim. Someone was taunting them, the placing of the shoes, going back to the forest knowing that the police were just there and that they could still be in the area, the chance that they could have possibly been caught. The police believe this killer was sophisticated and he enjoyed toying with the police. There was also a sweet wrapper at the scene that they took into evidence and Shauna's purse was also nearby. Obviously, I don't need to say that Shauna's mother was more than heartbroken. Her brother went to the home after identifying the body to tell her that Shauna had been found. And I guess the only positive, I don't think that's the right word in this situation, but they had DNA evidence. All they needed to do was pair it with someone. Police's first suspect was Shorter's stepdad, John Brown, as well as other close male family members. The reasoning behind this is just because abductions are more likely to occur from someone who knows a victim rather than a stranger. They took DNA evidence from John, as well as Shauna's stepdad, uncles and brothers. They looked into the boys at her school, parents and brothers of other Girl Scouts, members. They looked into everyone that they could think of that had a connection to Shauna somehow. They even looked into the man who found Shauna's body because he had a red car that was described as the same colour as the abduction vehicle but they didn't find any DNA matches. The police had a lead that the description of the man given by Dan Payton previously matched the description of a man called Ted Walker. I mean all they had was tall skinny and a hat but it was a lead nonetheless. Ted Walker 
Walker had met Shauna before because he worked at a local pizza shop. He was described as odd. Every time Shauna and her friends went to that pizza shop he worked in, he would try to hug them. They just found this a bit strange. He did have a son, so maybe he just liked children but they just didn't really like it that much. He also had a small red car, but again, they took his DNA and it didn't match, so they cleared him. Another suspect was a man called Michael Pruitt. He lived just a few doors down from the abduction site, and the day after Shauna's body was found, he just hopped on a bus and left town. Police found this really suspicious, so he went right to the top of the list of potential suspects. His house was searched, and they did find a small cubby hole, which they believed was big enough to fit a child inside. Uh, for example, the days after the kidnapping, hiding Shauna in there, which could possibly explain the scraped knees she had. But again, they searched it, they found nothing, and again, Michael's DNA didn't match, so they cleared him as well. They had taken over 100 DNA samples, but a year after Shauna's death, they still had nothing. Almost three years after Shauna's abduction, on July 30th, 1995, Robert Werner got a call that another abduction had been attempted in Oil City, but this time the victim had been attacked and beaten up before she escaped. The person responsible for this kidnapping attempt was James O'Brien. Uh, James and his brother Timothy were already known to the police for being sexually violent. Uh, they were actually known as Timmy and Jimmy, and Jimmy was the one being arrested for this crime. Authorities realised that this kidnapping attempt was also on the route that Shauna would have taken to walk home the night that she was kidnapped, so they try and link Jimmy to Shauna's kidnapping too. Unfortunately, both brothers were in jail when Shauna's kidnapping occurred. They also didn't fit the description or have a red car, so they were ruled out and no DNA samples were taken. In 1997, another young girl called Sheena Freeman went missing around Halloween time and she was also later found murdered. Thankfully for her case, the murderer, Nicholas Bowen, was found and authorities thought they might have finally cracked the Howe case. However, Nicholas would have only been 12 at the time of Shauna's kidnapping and the police weren't able to link the two cases together. Shauna's family were upset and angry. It had been five years and to them, the police had done nothing. They had no more information now than they had in 1992 and the case eventually went cold. This is when Rich Graham comes into the picture, a detective who is determined on solving the Shauna Howe case. He scoured the reports multiple times making sure there was no information being missed or if he could get any more information from rereading the case files. That's when he found the coroner's report and autopsy photos and noticed some discrepancies or just odd things about the reports. One of them being the shoe print on Shauna's face I mentioned earlier. That wasn't even mentioned in the coroner's report. He also realised even though Shauna was held captive for days before she was found, there was no evidence of any restraints on her wrists, ankles or anything. From this, he and criminal profiler Robert Ressler gathered that more than one person was involved in the crime to be able to stop Shauna from getting away and authorities had been going off that it was just one person for years just because they only gathered one DNA sample. Police went and they basically started the investigation from the beginning. They did a big sweep of the local area, seeing if there was any more information that they could gather. They ended up at a local fire department and I don't know how they didn't find this information out earlier, but they were informed that the fire department were called out in 1992 to a vehicle that was on fire and this vehicle was a red vehicle. And that car belonged to Ted Walker, the pizza guy. Let's say this was the car that was used in the abduction. All the evidence would be gone now, which is why the police think that it was originally set on fire anyway. They now thought Ted was involved somehow. Maybe there was some evidence that Shauna was in the car or maybe something happened in the car. Subsequently, Ted Walker was brought in for questioning. And when asked how he found out about Shauna's abduction, he replied, Tim and Jim O'Brien came and told me. This got Rich Graham suspicious of them being involved too, which is when the authorities told them that Jim and Tim were both in jail that night so it couldn't have been them, but Rich had never seen any reports documenting that they were both in jail that night. And again, with just a little bit of research, they would have found out that Tim and Jim had been bailed out of jail the night that Shauna was abducted. So this is it, Rich is all for it being them at this moment, so he goes looking for them. Tim O'Brien was in county jail at this time for sexual assault on two children, while Jim had been arrested because of an attempted abduction in another city. I mean, when 
you hear that, you just have to think that it's them. Rich goes to interview Tim in jail and asks for a DNA sample. He was cooperative, but did say that he had to speak to his attorney first. Rich also said that when he was leaving the interview, he saw Tim with a sweet wrapper. This was the same one that they found at the crime scene. They eventually determined that Tim's DNA sample did not match the one that they had, so they went to get a sample off Jim. Finally, in February 2002, 10 years after Shauna's murder, they have a match. Jim's DNA was the one that was found on Shauna Howe's body. Shauna's family finally have someone responsible for her death. Rich Graham believes that both brothers were involved, but neither Tim or Jim match the description of the abductor. They also don't have a red car. So now there's the possibility of a third offender. This makes the authorities go back to when Ted said that the O'Briens were the ones who told him about Shauna's abduction. Also the fact that he had a red car and matched the initial description of the abductor. They believe that they have their third man. And it all comes full circle when they bring him in for questioning and discover at the time of the crime, Tim, Jim and Ted were all apparently living together. Like what? He also admits that he may have opened his home up to some really bad people once and they may have done a disgusting thing. Ted was arrested as an accessory when he admits to helping the brothers, but the story he gave to why they did it was this. They had talked about abducting a child as a Halloween prank to make the Oil City police look foolish. They thought they would abduct a boy on Halloween in front of a witness. Once they called the police, they would hold this person for an hour or so before letting them go and they wouldn't get caught because the police weren't smart enough to catch them but plans changed. But Tim and Jim wanted to step it up a notch. They wanted to abduct a girl instead, also a couple of days earlier than planned. In interviews, Ted admits that he was the one who grabbed Shauna off the streets and then handed her over to the brothers in the car. They then drove off and he followed behind them in another car. Shauna was brought to Ted's house just outside of Oil City, taken upstairs by the O'Brien brothers, where Ted said he could hear Shauna screaming, get off me, let me go. Ted said that he did tell the brothers to let her go, but he left his home and by the time he got back, they were all gone. In 2001, a cellmate of Tim's named Ryan Heath tells authorities that during a lockdown, Tim confessed to him about being involved in Shauna's case, bragging and saying that he was the one who took Shauna out of the trunk of the car and threw her off the bridge. The O'Briens were tried jointly and finally convicted of the murder in 2005, almost exactly 13 years after Shauna's murder. They tried to pass the blame on to Ted but were found guilty of kidnapping, conspiracy, second degree and third degree murder but they were acquitted of first degree murder and rape. They are serving life in prison without the possibility of parole. Ted pleaded guilty to kidnapping and third degree murder and he agreed to testify against the O'Briens. Ted now, however, denies any involvement, claiming that he was coerced by law enforcement, stating, I've never seen Shauna Howe in my whole life. As God is my witness, I had nothing to do with this. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison. And after the trial, Shauna's mother, Lucy, said, I still have a hole in my heart, but I needed it to be solved. They took a little girl's life. They spent 12 years living their lives. My daughter would have been 24, but what does she have? Nothing. After Shauna's murder, Oil City put a ban on trick-or-treating past the afternoon. This went on until 2008, until the ban was finally lifted. And that is the end of today's case. It was quite unusual for this type of crime. Usually um, it would happen quite quickly. The person would get abducted and murdered in a very short space of time by one person. But for this one, Shauna was held captive for a couple of days and by multiple people. So it was a bit unusual, but let me know what you thought. And if you have any other recommendations for cases you'd like me to cover, then just leave a comment and I will try and get around to doing that. Also, don't forget to like this video if you'd like to see more of these videos from me and I will see you next time.